Hello, Sensor Squad, and welcome to another episode of Sensor Experts. You could say my excitement over this next one has grown incrementally over this absolutely fantastic topic called encoders. Encoders play a pivotal role in automation, but a lot of people find encoders hard to understand. So I am pleased to introduce one of our encoder experts from SICK, Mandy Liberty. Mandy, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, as our foremost encoder expert here at SICK, uh, what do you find most customers use encoders for? Yeah, so encoders at their core are a sensor that take a mechanical movement and translate that into an electrical signal. So in most applications, encoders are used to measure speed, angle, or position. Correct. There are two types of encoders, incremental and absolute. That's right. Incremental encoders typically output square wave signals and are often used to determine speed and direction. And absolute encoders provide a unique position value for each shaft location. This means they can always report the exact position, even after a power cycle. Yes. Each type has its own specialty and has lots of options for their mechanical design and electrical output, so they can measure different things. SICK actually has an entire factory's worth of encoders. <laughs> well, if that isn't the bee's knees, we should go have a look-see. Wow, this is absolutely amazing. We make millions of sensors here. Hey, Dan. Oh, hey, Mandy. That's right. We have some more chatting to do. We do. I'll be right down. Oh, hey, Mandy. Hey, Dan. Good to see you from, from down here. It's good so, to see you, too. All right, so what do you look for for an encoder? Yeah, so I like to boil it down into about three to four different steps. The first major step is what type of feedback that you want from the encoder. So are you looking for speed information or okay. maybe position information? That'll help you determine whether you need an incremental encoder or an absolute encoder. The next step is mechanical fit. You okay. Know, how, and so the things that you want to think about are how much space do you have in your application? What is the physical size that you can accommodate? And then how are you going to couple the encoder to whatever is moving and what you want to sense? So there's a lot of different options. There's a lot of variety. You can do fairly small diameter encoders all the way up to quite large encoders. Okay. You can also have solid shaft or hollow shaft. And actually, this is a great example. Uh, this is our DGS-80. Okay. We consider this our large bore encoder. Oh, large bore. I've been called that before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then once you have the mechanical fit fairly determined, okay. the next step really is to determine what kind of output that you want. All right. So if you're looking at incremental encoders here, you typically want to figure out what type of voltage amplitude that you want on the output for an incremental encoder. Okay. And for absolute encoders, you're really trying to determine what communication interface that you need for your control system. Okay. Awesome. Do we do IO link encoders we do also? IO link encoders. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So what? IO link is a great example. Okay. We also do Ethernet based encoders, oh. uh, can open, and many more. Awesome. So then, so we got the size, the application, or the output. What about application? Is that like where it's going to go? Does that matter? It does. Yes. Yeah. So that is the last step really is to think okay. about those finer points within the application. So some things maybe to consider is, you know, maybe the encoder is going to be in a food and beverage type application. Ah, uh, so it's washed down. Exactly. Okay. So in those situations, you want to consider the housing material and also maybe the IP rating. Another example could be if you have an AGV or an AMR and you require some safety certification for oh. either safe speed or safe steering, then a safety rated encoder also would really help aid in that installation process. Well, wow, very cool. And we make... Most of those here? We make a lot of encoders here, yeah. Right here in Minnesota. Awesome, we cool. Well, hey, yeah, let's keep going. Can you show me some more? I'd love to. Awesome, great. All right, well, actually, let me introduce you to Dan Wink, who is our senior manager for our production engineers and knows a ton about producing encoders. Hey, Andy. Dan? Dan, Dan, how are you doing? Awesome, so you are in good hands. See you guys. So Dan, thanks for coming uh, in and, and spending time here. Uh, spent a bit of time with Mandy, and she was talking about how people pick encoders and all the different encoder varieties we have, and yep. we're now here where, where we make them. So tell me more about this. Exactly, yeah, we build a lot of encoders here at our North American headquarters. Uh, the line behind me is where we build our DFS2X uh, product family encoder. Okay. And we have a number of combinations for this, a small number of parts in it, but lots of different combinations, up to over two billion combinations that we can build. Uh, we primarily ship here, or build here, in our facility to keep ourselves close to our customers and to be able to deliver in a quick fashion. So the first step is going to be uh, a programming station. So we are taking our core, so 
Okay. This is the primary core. core that we have inside of our product, and it's a programmable core. We program it here in our programming station according to the variant specifications. Okay. It literally takes 30 seconds. Doesn't take very long. Wow, all right. Next and that step. can make it to the, what the customer is looking for, exactly. make that part number. Exactly. Awesome. Our next step is, is to put in a shaft assembly. So there's a small little shaft assembly. This also meets our customer requirements. Yep. We press it in, it's actually glued in place, and then we press it. This is this whole station here is a setup on an automated setup. So it's hands away from the, okay. the, the operator, and it goes very quickly. And I see we've got some six safety light curtains, we got cameras, we got all sorts exactly. of six sensors on here for uh, making it safe and efficient. Yep. We don't want to shift the fingers with the no. Okay. With all the right. Our next step is going to be applying uh, a glue to around the core itself okay. and getting ready to put on a cover assembly. So there is hmm. a cover assembly that goes with each one of these. And then we come over here and we press it in place. Once we get to that point, the physical form of the encoder is pretty much done. Okay, so literally, as I'm talking, it, it literally takes that long. Our next step is to do a final test. This tests the encoder at various different revolutions and speeds. Oh, okay. It creates a record for it. When it goes, when it's done and it's completed, it will print out a uh, label for the product. That is our quality gate. I see. And I see you even have a inspector, uh, inspector vision camera here, making sure everything's exactly. The final step is going to be to uh, put on some accessories to the product itself as mm -hmm. it, it's outlined, um, and then we literally put it into the box, and that's it. That's all there is to it. And then we can ship it out very quickly in less than a week. In less than a week. Oh, that's amazing. All right, that was excellent. Thank you everybody for joining us. I really want to thank our encoder experts, Mandy Liberty and Dan Wing for taking their time and to giving us their insight and expert view of encoders and our local production right here in Minnesota. Thank you for joining us. This is Dan Brusky. Until next time, stay smart.